uh, <clears throat> just a few images of uh, the sugar plant plantations. Uh, these are in Jamaica, I think. But it was very labor intensive and also skilled so that the, the, the distilling, uh, the, the processing of the sugar cane and producing rum was a very, sort of large scale operation, really a factory system. And this fellow, uh, uh, Eric Williams, he was a student at Oxford, I think he was from Trinidad. He wrote a, his doctoral dissertation at Oxford was about cat was on this subject. The book was thoroughly published uh, in 1938, and his thesis was that slavery, particularly in the in the Caribbean, produced the capital that led to the Industrial Revolution. Uh, and if you go to places like Liverpool or Bristol in England, they're, they're, particularly I was in Liverpool a few years ago, I mean, it was a tremendous port. And it was, you know, there was a lot of slave, they didn't bring so many slaves there, but the products of slave labor and that sort of thing were going, the people went from Liverpool, ship's captains and so on, to engage in the slave trade. And Liverpool was a very impressive sort of grand place. Anyway, uh, uh, my friend, uh, late friend Dick Sheridan of the University of Kansas did a sort of follow-up book to Williams called Sugar and Slavery. And he supports the, the, the Williams thesis that, that the slave trade and the, sl the products of the slave trade uh, really enabled and supported the development of capitalism. In fact, it was sort of capitalistic with the factory system and so forth. Uh, there are some points of dis dispute among historians here, which I won't get into. Um, some people say, well, that's not really where the capital came from. But in any case, we're kind of documenting how this process worked in terms of specific industries. Well, now we come to 1776, the famous book by Adam Smith called The Wealth of Nations. And he was a foe of the mercantilist system. Uh, the mercantilists often had uh, royal warrants for their uh, existence as corporations. So you have the Royal African Company, the East India Company, the Dutch East India Company, and so forth, where they were chartered under royal authority. Well, he said we need to get away from that and, and move towards a strictly market system uh, without monopolies as such. He was a very big fan of competition and so on. So this is one of the foundation texts for modern capitalism. Uh, he developed the famous idea of the invisible hand uh, that um, the, the dynamics of the market of supply and demand would work as like an invisible hand to sort of adjust things and keep things functioning. Uh, and it did so almost automatically without any kind of human foresight or thinking about it. And, and it was almost magical. Uh, and he thought that was a good thing because it would, you know, if, uh, if there was a big, if there was a big demand for a particular product, uh, the price would be high. But then, when everybody started producing it, then the price would fall, and that would be a good thing. It was all sort of a self-adjusting mechanism. Well, of course, this, this has produced many graphic responses, uh, such as this one. Well, we come to Eli Whitney in the 1790s, who developed, who was an American, developed the cotton gin, which revolutionized uh, cotton production. But Whitney was also uh, an arms manufacturer, and he developed the uh, standardization of parts, where it used to be when you made, when you made weapons, each one would be produced as its own thing. I mean, it was like an artisan workshop. We well, said, look, if you divide it all up, and, and uh, Smith was a big fan of this, Division of labor idea too. Any gun could be, you know, the parts could be replaced and they could be industrial, made part of an industrial production. 